everyone. Welcome to today's episode of Dream for Change, an initiative by Dream Frontier Capital, uh, one of India's leading venture capital firms focused on climate technology. I'm Hrithika. I am a venture analyst at Dream Frontier, and I'm happy to have with me here today Dr. Dhuba Kutayasta, uh, the India Country Director of Climate Policy Initiative. I'll let uh, Dhuba introduce himself and tell us a bit more about his climate journey. Thank you, uh, Ritika. Good evening. Dhruba uh, Purkayasta, I, yeah, I came into climate about five to seven years ago with Climate Policy Initiative. But before that also, I was somewhat working on sustainable development. So after having spent 25 years in various industries, which does include 15 years in development finance, credit rating, management consulting, I joined Climate Policy Initiative. I've been leading the Climate Policy Initiative's India team and work over the last five, six years. And we have grown from a very small operation with about five to seven people uh, to about 30 people now. We work across sectors, primarily with the lens of finance, looking at the problem of climate from the side of the financial sector. Thank you. Okay, that's, that's great to know. We've all heard of climate policy initiatives. Uh, uh, the reports that have been put out by CPI have been instrumental in uh, shaping our understanding of climate finances. So uh, as the country director for India, you've seen climate policy initiatives work in other countries as well. Uh, and how do you see India playing a role in the climate discourse, in the global climate discourse? And how do you see India playing a very important role in Pending the global emissions. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Climate Policy Initiative, though a US nonprofit institution, we have operations in basically large, more, I would say, more climate important countries, which includes Brazil, Indonesia, some fair parts of South and East Africa, UK, India. So that's how we work with five or six officers across the globe. Our work at a country level is typically Brazil, Indonesia, and India. And we also work regionally across Asia, across Africa. And we are primary work centers around looking at the shortfall in climate investments because globally you are aware that the world needs an investment of and those numbers, though, keep varying. They are right now of the order of six trillion uh, investment required per annum till 2030 and four trillion of that in energy transition alone. Coming back to the point of India's role. See, I think uh, the G20 has a kind of effectively placed India into a driver's seat in the global climate finance discourse or rather global sustainable finance discourse more importantly. And you can see that the G20 baton has passed from Indonesia to India and then it goes to Brazil. And with CPI being present in all three places, I think we've played a, a some kind of an anchor role when it comes to climate finance, including being an integral part of the sustainable finance working group on the G20. So if you look at the leader's declaration, uh, I think even in difficult geopolitical situations, India has managed to carve out a consensus in terms of the need to address climate finance investments in developing countries. And that's a key thing that is important to have got a consensus here. And for the first time, they have put in a numbers to what the investment is required. You have a political declaration with numbers and a few mechanisms, uh, which includes the MDB reforms and subsequent re-architecturing the international financial institution architecture, though not concluded in the G20 leaders chapter, but finds a very strong mention which is now getting followed through. And hopefully the pathway that we are seeing now or the track that we are seeing, which is G20 to COP is going to lead to some effective results. Thank you. Yeah, it's very interesting that you mentioned the G20 
declaration. I think it's really big victory for India and for the world to get that consensus going. Uh, but where do you see climate justice coming? Do you see India playing an anchoring role in ensuring climate justice for the global south? Uh, yeah, thanks, Ritika. Uh, so climate justice has got different interpretations. Now, let me make it clear that one is we typically do not, and we are not an advocacy organization per se. We are more analytical data, analytical advisory organizations that we call it. Now, justice has different forms in the sense that is there a recognition of justice? Is there an addressing of the problem? Is there a redressal forum in terms of where climate justice can be? But the but I my my intuitive sense today is what I what I see globally is <clears throat> that the phrase of just transition has acquired a center stage. So whether or not uh, exact justice is delivered in terms of where people get affected due to this transition. But there is an explicit recognition of the need for this transition, which the world has to go through, a recognition of it being just and equitable. And that itself tells you that the international fraternity has recognized, notwithstanding the facts that there would be gaps in execution as you go through, because uh, while a few large countries uh, like India and Indonesia will not be able to make the transition in the way it is desired in the sense of, but I'd like to add one point. See, it is important to recognize in climate that input is not important, but the outcome is important. So then tendency often internationally is to focus on the input, which is which may be a fossil fuel, but let us keep the focus on reduction of emissions. And if we keep the focus on reduction of emissions, and one important point is the need to recognize transition finance as against what is a binary definition of green finance. If you are in renewable energy, you are green, but if you improve your emissions, you are bad. That I think is that discourse is changing that recognition is coming up, the need to support transition through transition financing and not label it in black and white in a binary dimension. So I think these are these are two important uh, dimensions in which we need to look at justice. Yeah, absolutely. That makes a lot of sense. And binaries are always bad, especially for a subject as complicated as climate change and uh, climate finance. So just taking a step back and talking about climate policy initiatives work. So uh, we've been doing a lot of important work across different sectors, climate finance, energy transition, renewable energy, and then in different countries as well. What sector according to you would be the turning point for India's decarbonization and as well as well as the well as well as decarbonization? Right. Thanks. Uh you know, transition and decarbonization. Uh, are the two terms that we are seeing today or hearing today. In some ways, if you apply decarbonization to the entire economy, it is decarbonization of entire economy reducing the emissions. Similarly, transition is basically telling you that the entire economy needs to move to a low carbon development path. And I was in a session today itself where the underlying aspect was saying, is this movement towards climate anti-development or is it possible to have both development and climate? Now, this is complex, but therefore there is, there is, a, there is a thought and increasing understanding that good climate is good development and good growth because what is growth is development but growth needs to come with equity and distributional equity that often gets affected and therefore the just transition safeguards are important. And climate is not divorced from the need to do development investments. Which sectors are important? And I limit myself to India. I think it is important. So India's <clears throat> Final energy consumption is still significantly fossil fuel driven. 
or fossil fuel intensive. But what happens is, as you move these sharp trajectories of policy interventions on renewable energy procurement, and which is a public policy driven instrument very clearly, on the transport side, when you have cars, two wheelers particularly, supported with subsidies, at the larger vehicle supported with government procurement and large, it sends signals back again to the supply chain for that investments. And therefore, these two sectors, energy and then transport remain critical. I want to kind of touch upon what is now getting called hard to abate. And the hard to abate parts are the steel, cement, and very marginally chemicals because they typically do not produce too much of CO2, but you have steel and cement, which remains hard to abate. And the point is, while energy can be managed through clean energy, there are process emissions in these two industries for which it is important that technology transfer happens because it's a global public good. And if your technology is not socialized in terms of transfer, then that change does not happen. Because if you want to shift to hydrogen, if you want to shift to different reducing agents, you want to shift to a lower clinker based cement or you substitute cement that requires a technology transfer, which is typically not there in developing countries. Absolutely makes a lot of sense. And since you talked about two things, you talked about decarbonization and you talked about transition. That brings me to my next question, which is that these are terminologies that are being thrown around a lot these days. We've been hearing a lot about these two things specifically. But what we don't have is a standardized definition of what actually would constitute these things. Like we also said that climate finance in itself is a term that has different interpretations. Climate justice has different interpretations. So when do you see climate change in the discourse and the terms becoming more standardized and their uh, existing more benchmarks? Because as a VC, there is a lot of policy risk associated for us as well when policies are not framed to the extent that they should. And when we are to go in, in, and invest in innovative technologies, but we're not sure of what will happen with respect to policy, uh, there is a risk associated for us. As well. No, thanks. Uh... Yeah, so if I want to come to uh, standardized definitions, there are two levels of it. One is often called a taxonomy. A taxonomy is a very detailed definition, like an EU taxonomy. ASEAN is having a common, and, and I, I do understand that India does not have a taxonomy or issued as a policy uh, document of defining what is green and climate. But let me just simplify this for you in the sense for the audience too, that climate finance is all the money that goes into mitigation and adaptation. If you add the money which goes into pollution, air pollution, which India has got 15 large towns which are significantly high on air pollution and maybe even if you take the top 10 towns globally, some seven would figure to be Indian cities. So if you add that money which is going from the public sector, from public finance and from the market into pollution, non-CO2. CO2, I do not consider it as pollution. And therefore, if you add that, it is called green finance. And third thing, if you want to add an overall social sector to it, and let's for the moment assume social sector is health and education. Let's assume social sector means health and education and maybe social protection. You add all those monies, they become sustainable finance. So if we all accept this, and I think this is accepted, and in India, because sovereign green bonds have been issued with a particular usage, they do cover all aspects of climate and green. So I would say that the lack of a taxonomy is probably not a binding constraint. However, having a taxonomy detailed to the last mile value chain would help financial flows. So I want to make myself clear, it is not a binding constraint in India necessarily, 
but having one which therefore aligns well with how international investors look at it. The second part of your question is policy consistency as far as VCs, private equity is concerned. Okay. So developing countries are not very uh, well known. If you go to, let's say, World Bank doing business reports, investment climate reports, India has done very well to come up from in the last 10 years, I've seen coming up from 140 to probably 60 is when the last doing business report. So the India has made significant leaps and bounds in two indices. One, in the doing business report of the World Bank and the global competitiveness index, if you see, which comes out from WEF, which is much more holistic. So therefore, both these indices do factor in policy consistency in which India has been seen to be improving. Now, having seen to be improving doesn't mean it is always consistent and necessarily not effective, you see, which it will. But I want to make one last point here. If it affects investments in climate, it does affect investment anywhere else. Because policy, if we are talking about inconsistency of policy, then it is equally applicable to a non-climate sector also. So I don't see climate sectors being subject to necessarily higher policy variance. At the same time, not having a definition and not having a clarity on what is climate finance does create a little bit of confusion when it comes to investments. Thank Absolutely you. agree with you. So just a follow up on this would be at what level should the dialogue be taking place between the private sector and the policy world on climate? Uh, <clears throat> dialogue always helps, Aritika. Dialogue always helps, but we have to also understand that climate is a policymaker's problem. Is a policymaker's problem. And when we look at finance, there is a regulation which is also concerned with how financial sector is going to face up to what is called climate risk. Now, the question therefore is, how would PEs, VCs, institutional investors look at more investments in climate sectors? It's dependent on two things. One, the policymaker and the institutions have to bring more bankable projects onto table because capital needs projects to put in money. The question is, what is missing is the project preparatory facilities which will then prepare the projects for which investments can happen. Just to give you a small example, you have hydrogen policy and you have a hydrogen mission. You would have one pilot hydrogen project on the ground. How do we deal with the problem of financing hydrogen when there are no projects on the ground? Because when you put projects on the ground with a PPA and an offtake, rubber hits the road and therefore a PE and a VC can evaluate one A on the risks, B on the returns and therefore would be able to make the required investments. I can carry on, but I suppose I was trying to make it as short as possible. Quite very well taken. In fact, my next question is going to be, what is the role that VCPs can play in delivering the climate finance goals? Sure. It's a question. So two things. One, I don't think VCs and PEs have a role in innovation. Now, that's my point is saying the innovation and therefore innovation in climate <clears throat> is a play of venture capital for sure, but I think it is one step before a venture capital can come in is what an incubation is required. Because when you have a business case and it's a visible business case for a VC to come in and a growth stage PE capital can come in at that stage. But if we tend to rely on saying innovation for climate, and I'll give you an example of innovation. I think India is trying to innovate on lithium batteries to sodium ion batteries, and which is a which is a very strong innovation. Uh, and that shift at the stage of so the point for capital is the gap between prototype to commercialization. I don't think is a VC game. It's not a play. It's a play at that stage where 
you have commercialization and scaling up possibilities which can get taken out by private equity capital to be then exited into the markets or could be to other strategic and financial investors. So I think this is this is an understanding and we do not have, while we have incubators here, I think there is a need for public capital to de-risk innovation and to also, I, I and I see from the supply chain point of view, there are movements and each of them are positive. Like if you take PLI, for example, which is a huge movement of, of localizing solar manufacturing, battery manufacturing, EV manufacturing, and that PLI sends those right signals for those investments. That is a stage in which VC can come in. Thanks. So here then my question is, what is, what is the role of subsidies in driving this innovation? Because we've seen fame playing a very important role in electric mobility. What other subsidies can we expect? What other policy interventions can we expect in other sectors? One of the simplest things, let me put it this way. The subsidy in climate uh, is a desirable subsidy. So when we talk about a subsidy, it's a public good. So the economic case is a de desirable subsidy, whether it goes to renewable energy, whether it goes through fame for EVs, whether it is rooted through taxation or a direct subsidy or a direct transfer, we can debate on those parts. But fundamentally, as a public good, as a as a requirement from a merit public good perspective, subsidy is a desirable thing. But the question that subsidy needs to ask itself is where is subsidy most effectively used? The question is subsidy is not unlimited in terms of public finance, but subsidies have to be used judiciously and leveraged appropriately. And that is where when you give out subsidies to all and sundry, in terms of whatever is commercially viable is also get subsidy. It's not a proper utilization. I'll give you an example of where subsidy. If you are able to make subsidy risk-based, which is to give the subsidy to the investor, to the lender, which means you protect through a credit enhancement or through a credit guarantee, in the case there is a default, your money or the subsidy money would last longer. We don't have such things where finance is subsidized. We do not have credit enhancement. We do not have credit guarantees, which are which are institutional mechanisms, which are missing in India and needs to be done. And that is how subsidy becomes more effective. The second thing on subsidy is we miss out on adaptation. Now, adaptation, we have to assume that climate change is on us. The data is steering the frequency and severity of climate events, even in India, and the loss of agricultural output and the heat, which is going to take away productivity of workers in many places, including heat islands for which. So therefore, the investments that have to be made in adaptation would need to necessarily not be business models, but will have to be designed and effectively done as public-private partnerships. India has a huge experience of having built infrastructure through roads, power transmission lines, and ports and port terminals. The same models can be used for building adaptation and resilient infrastructure. That is where the subsidy can be more effectively used as viability gap funding, which is not new at all to the Indian policymaker. Absolutely agree with you. So uh, initially, so you talked about uh, hard to evade sectors, including steel as one of the examples. But what we have noted is that a lot of major private steel players in India have committed to net zero targets, setting their targets as 2050, 2060. Do you see carbon markets and carbon offsets playing a role in that? Do you think that carbon markets are an effective decarbonization strategy? Okay, let me share my view on carbon markets. I have to split it up into two parts. One, in fact, rather three parts. One is voluntary carbon markets. So let us park that aside. One is cap and trade carbon markets, which is national and within the country. Yeah. One, I'll deal with the Article 6 international aspects later and if there is time. So when we deal with cap and trade, and let me limit myself to India here. 
India has a long history of energy efficiency and renewable energy offsets, whether it is through RPO or whether it is through the PAT scheme, which you get ESERTs, energy efficiency certificates, which means that the national market is national carbon market for the last 10 years or so effectively existed as energy offsets and you assume that energy improvement is good for carbon emissions too because energy was coming from carbon intensity. Now, given the initiatives taken by NCN, the Bureau of Energy Efficiency, it is about converting this ESERTs into carbon markets, which means the standards which were there in efficiency will get converted to standards in carbon emissions. And those ESERTs, if I were to act, impute a value to the ESERTs, I come by simple arithmetic, I come to about five to six dollars, which is not a bad price for carbon markets happening in a developing country. It's not a bad price. But at the same time, <clears throat> in order to decarbonize hard to abate sectors, the carbon price requirements which offsets the cost escalation is of the order of 50 to 60 or even more. So we don't bridge that with the national. Is the national carbon markets an effective instrument or institutional mechanism? Yes, but for a certain period of time only. For a some period of time. And why some period of time? Because as you, if you are doing inefficiently and I'm doing it efficiently and the cap is 100 and you emit 20 and I manage in 80, I will, you will buy that 20 from me today, but tomorrow you will also improve and I will also improve. Your need will come down and I my, my product to sell will come down. So therefore, this will come to a convergence because the regulation will have to become stronger stringent and more stringent. So I don't think regulation can always cope up with it. But is it an important institutional mechanism to start with? Yes, for making a difference for a certain period of time, yes, but it will not continue forever as a market. Voluntary carbon markets, on the other hand, have much lower prices and they are driven primarily from the need, I won't say need to meet net zero, they are driven from the need to contribute and therefore, in voluntary carbon markets, it is not only carbon. It is carbon plus additional livelihoods, gender inclusion, financial inclusion. All of this come in is what we call the quality of carbon credits. So that's a different play altogether. So I'll pause here because getting into Article 6 and international will take a long time. Yes, I understand. But we've seen India come up with a voluntary carbon market policy this year, uh, actually last year, 2022-23. So, it's um, come up with a national carbon market. So not voluntary carbon markets were always there. Right. So we're right. actually just getting into the discourse about voluntary carbon right. markets more and more in India. And it's the, car <coughs> the carbon market institution has existed globally for a very long time. UETS has been a very uh, successful example to some extent of the carbon market. So uh, it will be interesting to see uh, to what extent India can also succeed on that track. But just taking uh, a bird's eye view on climate finance now to understand from you uh, where we are in terms of global financial flows. You mentioned six to eight trillion dollars annually till 2030. Uh, so where are we on that right now? We've been promised hundred billion dollars through the Paris Agreement, uh, but would love to get no, your thanks. views on this. Okay. So you're asking an institution which tracks global climate finance year on year, and we have a decade of data on that. Yes, exactly. So the last tracker of global climate finance talks about about $800 billion of the order of magnitude of 800 versus 3 trillion required. Now that's globally. We do that in India. We'll do that in this year also because we have a two-year lag, the last one. We all know that NDC had put out $160 billion required. And what we find in tracked finances of the order of 44, 48 billions, billion. So not very different. What is India? What is world? 
So 25% investments are happening globally from what is required. The required number comes from Paris Agreement, from COP, from many places that this is an investment and currently find an endorsement into declarations too. How will that be met globally? How will that be met in India? Okay. How will that be met in globally? If you look at global output or a global GDP of the order of $100 trillion, that cannot intermediate $6 trillion to climate alone. That's not possible because you have a savings of 8 to 10% globally. Even in India, that's difficult rather because India is a 30% savings economy with about 18% financial savings. And then you have demands of industry, agriculture. And we are talking of incremental investment in climate. Let's remember that. It's not business as usual. This is what the economy needs to incrementally invest. So increasing an investment rate from an existing savings dimension requires a rethinking on saying, how do I get capital from what is already there? Now, globally, I think the balance sheets of those GFANS institutions have committed to, to sort of 40%. And I don't think that 40% is easily attainable. But there is a commitment of 150 trillion of balance sheets, which are longer term pension funds, longer term sovereign funds, longer term insurance funds, which therefore can find its way into developing countries climate investments, the only barrier to be transcended is the cost of capital is high and it capital comes to developing countries. To that effect, we have proposed and I can send the links to you. We have proposed, we have worked on the cost of capital in at least 50 countries and we we'll find a wide variation with Germany at 4% and Argentina at 50. So therefore, there is, there is a cost that a money needs to bear now, at 50, there will be no investment because the returns at that level will not be possible. So similarly, if you say there is a need for an institutional de-risking mechanism, which doesn't exist globally, so that cross-border capital flows can be enabled. And this can work jolly well for equity investments too. I'm not necessarily only talking about debt here. Nobody usually de-risks equity because... There is a domestic investor who is making a strategic investment decision, but debt is mandatorily required. Otherwise, the equity investor does not make its adequate returns. So in order to make that debt flow, how does that happen in India? What we see is India is significantly domestic investments and not international. So India's domestic intermediation helps to reach whatever India has reached for till now. And we expect that to increase with certain regulatory directions, policy directions and regulatory guidance to the financial sector. And I think it will become imperative that India attracts global capital investments because the gap cannot be bridged by domestic intermediation alone. Thanks. Absolutely. Thank you. So just uh, one or two final questions from my side since we're unfortunately running out of time. Uh, we've seen uh, that Climate Policy Initiative has been doing a lot of knowledge dissemination work as well. Uh, you recently uh, collaborated with IM Ahmedabad to educate policy makers on climate change and sustainable finance. So can you tell us a bit more about those initiatives? Right. Thank you. We have a project which is we, we run something called a Center for Sustainable Finance. That is a separate program initiative. I happen to be the director for the Center for Sustainable Finance. And the idea, it has been funded through philanthropy and multiple philanthropy has supported it. And we would like Indian philanthropy also to come in and support the same. The idea behind is to create knowledge. And by the way, create not rocket science, create practical disseminable knowledge through reports and research reports, which is globally, there is a huge amount of work happening from BIS to ISSB to NGFS and the financial, you have ICMA, you have IOSCO, you will know 
there are venture capital associations, you have a plethora of CDP, you have a plethora of institutions, IFRS Foundation. So we are just trying to simplify, make that repository and make it available for the Indian financial sector, one. Two, we are engaged. So IMA is a recent addition. Otherwise, we are engaged with RBI training institutions for the higher levels of banking sector boards and management through CAFRAL and State Bank Academy, where we impart, uh, I would say, uh, sessions and training on sensitizing on the aspect of climate and sustainability and how does it affect finance and why finance should be concerned with it and also bring to fore how what regulation is doing for them to report including SEBI and RBI reporting on risks that climate change imposes on the bank's balance sheets or for mutual funds and other financial investors. So broadly, knowledge, training, and build capacity. And final part, which IMA is a starting point, is to engage with academia so that we can mainstream sustainability across frontline courses. The point we are making is that is for the next generation because climate change is intergenerational. So we see a value in engaging with academic institutions where young people are going and therefore they get sensitized irrespective of what they study, economics, finance, geology, biology or whatever it may be. That's the last leg of the initiative and we call it the Center for Sustainable Finance. Absolutely. I think climate change is one subject that needs to be demystified, simplified so that everyone can engage and understand because it's going to impact all of us. Uh, so just one final question for you on a more personal level, sir, is uh, who are some of your role models, some of the people who actually helped develop your understanding of climate sustainability and what are some of the resource materials that you keep turning back to? It's something that uh, people in the audience can also read and develop their understanding. Okay. So because we look at the problem from the side of finance, we are mostly referring to what knowledge is getting created by NGFS, BIS, the Basel, WEF, UNFCC. So these are resources. Some country documentation, particularly like the UK has taken initiative of greening financial system and increasing green finance. These are some references. I would not be able to talk from a more academia or a journal perspective for that matter but there are because i i'm more of a practitioner even if i do teach otherwise but from a practitioner point of view you have consulting organizations like mckinsey growth in mckinsey global yeah uh think tanks who have put up signal mckinsey dalberg they do put up significant amount of original knowledge for the public domain but yeah, our kind of references are dependent on what's movement which is happening across the board, including the various committees that we contribute to and work with. Uh, for example, the high level expert committee, expert group on finance, the MDB reforms group, the capital adequacy, the bridge term initiative and so on. So all of it, and we do put out our own knowledge based on what is happening that is a great repository i think one can refer to the climate policy initiative website and most of it is also a public domain thank you absolutely and in fact i also keep referring to cpi as well over the years i've read through most of your finance reports as well and it's very very interesting to see how the work is going thank you thank you so much uh so for being here with us today and for sharing your insights on climate finance. I'm sure everyone in the audience uh, will find it very engaging and very insightful. Thank you so much for your time today. Uh, for staying in touch with you and one more for me. Thank you. Thank you.